Many have asked for details about what was the most frightening, powerful evil entity my ancestors faced, most assuming some kind of demon or fallen angel. But in truth, the worst thing they ever encountered was a man, a crusader tactician named Dmitri Videska, a genius considered barbaric even for the era. He led to many deaths on both sides of the conflict. Unknown to most, he was the heir to a long line of occult demon worshippers, and used such abilities in the war and after to become truly inhuman, seeking immortality and to unmake God's creation. The sons of man, who were formed to stop him, finally succeeded centuries later, led by a mysterious fully covered warrior bearing a strange face like helmet. The unmaker was banished to hell, but that was not the end of him. He would return centuries later, as something much worse. The crusader turned Dark Lord was slain and thought to be permanently trapped in hell. Three centuries later, he burst up from the earth with a small army of demons. Some believe this was due to him conquering a region of the underworld, literally stealing ground from Lucifer himself. My ancestors, a father and son pair of paladins, holy warriors dating back to Charlemagne, and the church's top exorcist priest, were just barely able to banish him back to the abyss. But he would return once more, creeping into people's dreams through fear, including the heir to those who'd killed him, Harold. The final entry in his journal says that Videska has returned, and it is to me and my allies to end him. I have no writings from him from after this point. This tale and many more will be chronicled in the novel series The Old Breed. Book one coming soon. The story of Sons of Man founder, Raphael Caron, begins in the First Crusade, where he served as a prolific warrior and military leader. The things he encountered therein, led to his later travels north, where he rose to lead a Norse monster hunting guild. He came to believe his supernatural battle prowess the result of occult meddling from fellow crusader, Dmitri Videska, who he now knew to be a demonic sorcerer, on the road to something much worse. Caron reached out to a friend from the war, a paladin in the lineage of Charlemagne. The two men brought these groups together under the church's banner, forming the Sons of Man, to stop Videska and his ilk. After his death, some said his body remained mostly in decayed, and corrupt, possibly self-mummified. When the warder succeeded in ending Videska years later, they were led by a mysterious silent knight, armored head to toe, with a helmet bearing an etched face. Some believed that this was Caron himself, lifted out of his grip for the final battle, like some kind of horrifically macabre medieval version of the Winter Soldier. Paladins were an order of holy empowered knights, dating back to the East century. Initiated by the famed King Charlemagne, they were said to possess superhuman abilities, granted to them by the Christian God. They were also central to the creation and protection of powerful holy Christian relics. The most famous among them, a leader named Roland, was slain in the Roncevaux Pass, inspiring the Song of Roland. He is still celebrated in parts of Europe to this day. Centuries later, several of them marched east to join in the Crusades. It was here that one of them, Sir Baldwin, met Raphael Caron, who would go on to lead a Norse company of monster hunters. Baldwin and Caron would eventually bring the two groups together under the church's banner, forming the Sons of Man. The paladin tradition continued within the Sons of Man, eventually including three generations of my family, several of whose holy relics we still possess to this day. Bridget was one of the most important Celtic goddesses, associated with wisdom, healing, protection, and more. Her priests were druids, ancient religious leaders and lore keepers. Some of them were even believed to possess supernatural abilities, said to have connections to animal spirits, positive interactions with the Fae, and other spiritual beings of the forest. Sadly, the association with such entities eventually led to persecution and lies about devil worship. My ancestor worked with a witch named Brigid, that he came to believe was a human avatar of the goddess. According to his writings, he would go on to witness her perform numerous miracles, and she gifted the family with the seeds for this supposed fate tree. There is also a Saint Brigid associated with Ireland. Some believe her to be purely a Catholic transplant of the deity. Harold, my ancestor, believed the saint may have been a previous avatar of the goddess. 
The shapeshifter is one of the most commonly held supernatural beliefs across cultures, sometimes featuring people becoming wild animals, others a fearsome amalgamation of man and beast. Putting aside examples that fall under the Fae or other mythological non-human entities, my ancestors chronicled several varieties of these magical people, including those monstrous, as well as heroic, the Kursnik, Slavic vampire hunting shaman that took animal form. Also the Norse berserkers, ancient warriors some claimed took the form of bear and wolf men, and many other types of seers and shaman throughout Europe. My ancestor writes that the affliction of lycanthropy was mutated into a more monstrous variation by doctors trying to cure it in the late 19th century. My great-grandfather continued the tradition of run-ins here in the U.S. I found several of the documents of his cases dealing with creatures similar to skin walkers. I even ventured to an area he claimed held heavy activity and received a response when I whistled. The Navajo tale of skin walkers tells of dark medicine men that kill creatures to capture their form. The most common for both good and evil being crows, wolves, normally of a pure white or black color, and in some places, massive monstrous snakes or gators and crocodiles. An interview with a descendant of a Seminole woman my great-grandfather worked with revealed the story of their conflict with such a being. Among the various historical vampire hunting traditions throughout Europe, perhaps one of the most interesting comes from Slavic folklore. The Kursnik, supposedly hailing from Eastern Europe, primarily hunted a type of vampire called Kudluk. My ancestor was briefly romantically involved with a woman who fit the description perfectly. He wrote that she was a hunter who specialized in vampires, but displayed various supernatural abilities. The Kursnik were said to possess shamanic powers, taught to them by Slavic, nymph-like fairies called Vila, including gifts like connection to animal spirits. In hunting the Kudluk, it is said the two would meet in animal form. The Kursnik in the form of a white wolf, the Kudluk a deep black one. Given that these stories were not written down until after Christianity came to the region, some believe their origins lie in other pagan European traditions, others still that it dates back to ancient Babylon. Morden's breed was a species of bad demon-like vampires my ancestor wrote about at length. They were possibly the inspiration for various incarnations of gargoyles and even some accounts of demons. They were said to swarm down in hordes, onto whole villages, tearing people out from their homes, devouring their flesh, and considered worst of all, dragging away survivors to join the brew. Not but ruined graveyards were left in their wake. Morden, their monstrous lord, was said to be such a horror for never having been human at all. Rather, coming from a brutish ogre-like race of the ancient past, which I believe was Neanderthal. Similar variations on the vampire from around the world, such as in Western Africa as well as Central and South America, may indicate the vampire affliction infecting other proto-human races, such as Denisovans or Homo erectus. 